Okay, very good. Then let us go on. We will now begin with our section three of the lecture, which is on integral convergence theorems. There are several of them. We will start with simpler ones and then go step by step to more difficult and more, um, let's say, um, overarching convergence theorems. But before we actually prove anything of that, kind we will uh, study in general the Schwinger parametrization for which we already have seen many examples and actually uh, we already discussed the Simancic polynomial. But let us just uh, give uh, the full theory of the Schwinger parametrization here once and for all. Uh, actually not full, but we will restrict ourselves as before to a scalar theory. That means the numerators of all integrals are always one. There is no p slash or um, uh, p mu or anything like that in the numerator. And at the moment, we don't yet check the convergence. At the moment, we interchange limits just as we like, and the convergence will be checked later. Okay, we begin with a general scalar loop integral, which is an integral over many different loop momenta, k1 to kl. Each integral has d dimensions and uh, the usual prefactors, and then we have an integrand, which is a product of many propagators, d1 to di. i is the number of internal lines, in other words, the number of propagators we need to integrate over, and each propagator has the usual form uh, momentum square minus mass square plus i epsilon. And the momenta are linear combinations of the loop momenta and external momenta. And uh, the coefficients may be chosen to be one, um, but they may also be chosen to be different from one in this more generalized case. Now we do the Schwinger parametrization of this. And that means for each internal propagator we can write the one over d as an exponential. We get a minus i for each propagator, and uh, then we have still the loop integral. And we get alpha integrals for each propagator, so alpha 1 up to alpha i for the number of lines. Each alpha integral goes from 0 to infinity. And the integrand is e to the i times the linear combination d i times alpha i. Then, as we discussed, this linear combination can now be rearranged, uh, as we did in our examples, as a quadratic form. So it is, of course, quadratic in the loop momenta and also up to quadratic in the external momenta. So we can write it like this, k1 to KL as a row times a matrix times a column K1 to KL. So this is a matrix with L by L entries. For each loop, there is a row and a column. And uh, this then gives a quadratic form in all the loop momenta, plus two times some coefficient J transpose times this column K1 KL. This is a linear term in all the loop momenta and the coefficients may be some linear combinations of external momenta. And then we have minus K prime as we abbreviated it and this is simply um, a combination of the masses and the I epsilons. So concretely this is sum of all the M I square times alpha I uh, minus I epsilon times the sum of all the alpha I that we saw in the examples. And this k prime will not be changed in the course of our calculation. So now what we did was we rewrite the quadratic form, uh, let's say in two steps. Um, we uh, can define new, um, let's say, a uniform loop momentum L, which has not d components, but l times d components. So this would be summarized as just a vector l. l transpose m times l plus and so on. 
and then we can write this as L double prime, as in our example, square plus uh, something else. And uh, then we can complete the square in this way and uh, we obtain after some steps which are identical to our examples, L double prime square without any extra coefficient anymore plus or minus J transpose times M to the power minus one times J plus a new constant K minus the old constant K prime. And so this is exactly the sequence of steps that we did for a two-loop diagram, but it is, of course, totally identical in the general case. And this new constant here um, I'm sorry, uh, this doesn't exist. Oh. Right, um, here. In, to stay in line with our previous notation, if we write down the quadratic form, I forgot, of course, the term without loop momenta. And we always split it up in this way, that we have one constant which depends on the external momenta, and uh, this constant k prime, which only depends on the masses and the i epsilon. So here there are things like p square from the external momentum times some combination of the alphas, and uh, that we need to take into account as well. And uh, that is useful to combine this expression, which depends on the external momenta, with this one, which also depends on the external momenta. But this can be left alone. So anyway, if we do the sequence of steps in the identical way to before, then we have this integration measure of an L times D dimensional loop momentum, D L times D of this generic variable L double prime is connected to the previous L times D dimensional loop integration over L, which is basically the same as K1 to KL, times the determinant of this matrix M to the appropriate power of D over two. So, and therefore, if we plug in this replacement, then we can replace the exponent here, which is the linear combination, by the quadratic form. The quadratic form now contains the new loop momenta with a changed integration measure. And in terms of those L double prime loop momenta, the integration is a pure Gauss integral with no modifications whatsoever, not even a prefactor is involved at all. So the loop integration over all the L loop momenta is trivial, as in our examples. And what remains is the exponential of the rest, which is not integrated over. And from the uh, L times D dimensional loop integration, we just get a trivial uh, prefactor to the power of the loop integrations. So let's immediately write down the result. Maybe here. The result is equal to minus I to the power I of the alpha integrals, alpha one to alpha I, and then uh, in the notation that we always had, it was the prefactor mu to the power d0 minus d times 4 pi to the power minus d over 2. And this entire factor comes to the power L because for each loop integration we have this factor. And then for each loop integration there is another factor, namely i to this uh, factor to the power uh, 1 minus d over 2, and also this factor appears for every loop, so this also comes to the overall power L. And then we get times the determinant of the matrix M to the power minus d over 2, because uh, the integration measure has to be transformed backwards, and e to the i w, where w is the remaining uh, exponent that we obtained in this quadratic form. So I just uh, squeezed it in here because this is not yet the nicest way to write the equation, but this is what comes directly out of the calculation which is copied from our examples from before. Now let's just write the result maybe in a nicer form. That means our integral I defined like above is 
given by minus i to the power i. For each internal line, we have this factor. And then let's combine it like this. i to the power 1 minus d over 2 times u to the power d0 minus d times 4 pi to the power minus d over 2. And this entire factor comes to the power of the number of loops. Then times the alpha integration from 0 to infinity over all the alphas, alpha 1 to alpha capital I. And now let me use this notation curly u to the power minus d over 2 times e to the i w, where w is the ratio of another semantic polynomial v divided by this u here, minus k prime. k prime was defined above. And the semantic polynomial u, we know what it is because we calculated it. It is the sum over all spanning trees and for each spanning tree we take the lines which are outside the tree and multiply the corresponding alphas. That is the semantic polynomial u and the semantic polynomial v is uh, more complicated. We have determined it also in examples and we know it is a polynomial Uh, of second degree in the external momenta. So let's say proportional to the external momenta square. And it is also a polynomial in the alphas with the power L plus one. So it is a polynomial in the alphas of one degree higher than the semantic polynomial U. And one can also give a similar relationship for the semantic polynomial in terms of trees, but that relationship we don't need right now. Therefore, I have not derived it, and therefore I will also not specify it here, but there is a similar formula uh, to you also for V. But that is the final result. Okay, This is the result for our integral. And this is the, uh, all I want to say to this topic. So whenever you have a loop integration, an L loop integration over an arbitrary number of normal Feynman propagators, then you can equivalently rewrite it as an integral over alphas, one alpha for each line, and the integrand is this, an exponential. And in the exponent, you have a rational function of the alphas, which is, however, uh, overall of degree one in the alphas. So for alpha going to infinity, this goes to infinity, unless you have certain special relations between the masses and momenta such that you obtain infrared divergences. But in general, for large alpha, this goes to infinity and therefore the exponential function gives you a damping. And then we have the semantic polynomial u, which comes from the determinant in which contains the ultraviolet divergences and for which we already know something about power counting. And therefore, we can now equivalently discuss convergence and integral um, properties for the original version of the loop integration or for this version in terms of the alpha integrations. And we will do it mainly in terms of the alphas because that uh, generates easier proofs. And therefore, let us now do the first proof.
the convergence theorem for power counting finite loop integrals. We have already mentioned this in the context of our examples in the first section of the lecture. Uh, and uh, had this intuitive idea that after we cancel the subdivergence, the sub uh, integral is finite, and if then also the overall diagram is finite, then uh, we really get some finite integral. Or if we had some diagrams uh, like this, um, where you have a finite one loop sub diagram and also the two loop diagram maybe uh, is, is uh, finite by power counting, then any sub diagram you are looking at is power counting finite and we wondered whether this means that actually the integral mathematically converges. And this is exactly the case. So there is a very simple criterion for finite integrals, namely you only need to look at power counting, but not only at the overall power counting of the full graph, but you need to look at the power counting of each individual subgraph. And then the statement is the following theorem. If the power counting of the full graph is smaller than zero and the power counting of each subgraph H is also smaller than zero, for any subgraph H contained in G, then we can prove that the integral in Schwinger parametrization converges. it converges at least at alpha going to zero and also at alpha going to infinity provided uh, there are no infrared divergences. For example, if all the masses are different from zero then automatically we have in uh, our W in the exponent a term uh, which goes to infinity no matter which alpha becomes large and then the integral converges at the upper limit no matter what the details are. But uh, ultraviolet divergences correspond to small alphas and uh, the integral converges if all the subdiagrams and the diagram itself have negative uh, or superficial degree of divergence. So, this is an important theorem. Let me just give you some references. So, this theorem is completely proven in the textbook by Itzik Saint Subert, section 814, so you can read it there. And uh, it goes back to, uh, for example, a paper by Bershaw and Lum from 1976. But similar theorems have already also been proven even earlier than that. And I might give some comments on the literature. So how are we going to prove this theorem? It's now almost, uh, okay, it's not trivial. But we have uh, so many building blocks of the proof already established but that we just need to combine them properly and then the proof um, becomes really straightforward. So the first obvious thing to do is we split the alpha integral into sectors where the alphas are ordered in particular ways and then for each sector we study the convergence independently. And then in each sector, we make use of our knowledge of power counting. So the alpha integration is split into sectors corresponding to some orderings. And maybe uh, to give even more hints to the literature, uh, I think the original idea 
for splitting the integral in such a way in two sectors is not uh, from Berger and Lamb, but uh, it goes back at least to Hepp in 1966. So here, uh, definitely already introduced the idea of splitting this into such sectors corresponding to ordering. So and again, for us, it's sufficient to choose one ordering, and why not the simplest one, alpha 1, smaller or equal than alpha 2, smaller or equal than, and so on, up to smaller or equal than alpha i. And then uh, it's just a matter of notation to add all the other orderings. In other words, we do not yet make use of these ranges of definition D corresponding to the labeled maximal forests, but here we just use the normal ordering. And so there are <coughs> I factorial different orderings. We look at one of them and all the other ones behave in the same way. So there are I factorial such sectors. Then I think I need to delete this, but uh, you know the Schwinger integral, basically in order to study convergence, of course, we only need to look at the integral with the u in the integrand, and for small alphas, the exponential i to the i, e to the iw behaves like a constant, because it is overall a rational function of degree one in the alpha, so for small alpha, it goes to uh, zero, and the exponential function goes to a constant. Okay, namely, what do we do? The only additional thing we need to do uh, on top of our building blocks we have established is now to do an extremely clever integration trick. And the trick is we need to change the integration variables in an optimal way. And then we can easily read off the convergence. So we do a clever change of integration variables. And what is this clever change of integration variables? It is something that I already announced several times. Namely, if you have such alphas, you can introduce an overall alpha which runs from zero to infinity and lots of ratio variables which correspond to the ratios between the individual alphas which then run between zero and one. And then we can implement this um, ordering by uh, uh, always introducing a ratio, so alpha i minus one to alpha i is smaller than one. So we introduce a ratio variable for that. Alpha i minus two is smaller than alpha i minus one, so we introduce a ratio variable for that, and so on. So in other words, we start with the biggest one, alpha i, and uh, okay, we could you rem let it as a variable, but actually it becomes even easier if we do it like this, beta i square. Then beta i square still runs from zero to infinity. And uh, let's keep track of the integration measure. d alpha i is the same as two times beta i times d beta i. Okay, very simple change of integration. But now what do we do for the next? Alpha i minus one, we introduce a ratio variable. So we write it as beta i square times beta i minus one square. Now this beta i minus one square corresponds to the ratio between the two, and this is smaller or equal than one. Then we implement uh, the inequality. So this runs from zero to one. What is the integration measure? d alpha i minus one is uh, simply given by two uh, beta i square, and then beta i minus one times d beta i minus one, right? So we replace the alpha by the corresponding d beta, and then we pick up this additional factor. So the factor blows up a little bit. And now it goes on. So for alpha i minus two, we do the same. So we write the next as a product of three betas, and the third beta goes from zero to one, and then we implement the inequality. And for the measure, we obtain something else with three factors here. And then it goes on. So let's say alpha one is then given by beta i square 
times beta i minus 1 square and so on up to beta 1 square and we replace the measure like this d alpha 1 is equal to d beta 1 times 2 times beta 1 times all the other betas beta i square beta i minus 1 square and so on up to beta 2 square. So it blows up but it's extremely simple. So we have transformed all the integration measures and we know what the integration range is. So let's say an integral over product of all the alpha i from 0 to infinity now becomes an integral from 0 to infinity over the beta i and many integrals from 0 to 1 over all the other betas, beta i minus 1 to the beta 1. And what is now the product of all these factors here, the products of the factors appearing in the integration measure? So for each integration measure, we pick up a factor 2. So we get 2 to the power i. For each internal line, we get a factor 2. Then how many factors of uh, beta 1 do we get? Let's start with beta 1. Where is beta 1 here? Beta 1 appears only at the very last moment, so beta 1 appears to the power 1. How many factors of beta 2 do we get? Beta 2 appears here, squared, and at the next line, beta 2 would appear to the power 1. So we get beta 2 to the power 3. How many times do we get beta 3? Beta 3 appears in the three lowest lines, and we get beta 3 to the power 5, and so on. Beta i. Beta i appears in every integration measure change, and once it appears linear, and uh, i minus 1 times it appears squared, so we get beta i to the power 2i minus 1. That is exactly the uh, change of the integration. So we get a huge bunch of factors of beta, and uh, but the integral is now unconstrained. All the betas run between 0 and 1 or between 0 and infinity, and they are independent of each other. And the inequalities are implemented by this factor here. So that is a clever trick. And now let us consider any subdiagram, uh, not any subdiagram, but a subdiagram uh, out of, let's say, alpha 1 up to alpha s. So we take the ordered alphas. We go according to the ordering, but at some line we stop. So it's like in the recipe we did before at some point. So for example, in this graph, if we take the ordering as before, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, we might take, for instance, subdiagram consisting out of the first three lines or the first four lines, and so on. And then these subdiagrams might have zero loops or one loop, or in the example, one, two, three, four, five, six. If we go up to six, then we have a one-loop diagram. If we go up to five, then we have a three-level diagram, and so on. So consider such a diagram. What are the properties of this diagram if we go to the index S? So there are now many such diagrams, step by step. Each diagram constructed like this has a certain number of loops. Let's call it LS. And a certain number of lines. Well, what is the number of lines in that subdiagram? It's S by definition. S. Now, question What is the power counting of that subdiagram? Omega 
of this subdiagram, let's call the subdiagram gamma s. Omega of this subdiagram gamma s. It is of course determined as usual. The uh, omega is determined as the number of uh, numerator minus denominator powers of the loop momentum. So here it's d times L sub s minus 2 times s loops minus internal lines. And what do we know? We know by uh, assumption that this is negative because every subdiagram has negative degree of divergence. So this is a condition of our theorem. That is good. On the other hand, we know something else, namely our power counting lemma. We know how our, sub, uh, our semantic polynomial u behaves if a subset of alphas goes to zero. Now we want to study how our semantic polynomial behaves uh, in this integration region. Now we integrate instead of over alpha, we integrate over beta from zero to one or so. So we need to know how our semantic polynomial behaves as a function of all the betas. We know how it behaves as a function of the alphas. Uh, let's translate it into a property as a function of the betas. So our power counting lemma What do we know if we take our semantic polynomial u as a function of the alphas still, and we take all the first s alphas, let's say they are all proportional to rho, and all the other alphas, they are constant. What do we know about the power counting of this we know it because we uh, have determined the power counting. It goes exactly according to the number of loops corresponding to this subdiagram defined by exactly those alphas. So here it's rho to the number L of the loops for the subdiagram is times a constant plus higher orders in rho. And the constant is non-zero. So we can estimate our semantic polynomial for uh, the case where a subset of alphas becomes small. What does that mean in terms of our new variables? Now you see the magic of the new variables. This is still quite complicated. So we need to speak in terms of subsets of alphas and so on and so forth. Now what do the new, new variables do? They completely disentangle this power counting. So let's look at it in terms of the new variables. We have the following. Instead of alpha 1, we have beta i square times and so on all the betas. Let's say at some point there is beta s square, then up to beta 1 square, comma. What is alpha 2? Alpha 2 is beta i square and so on up to beta s square up to beta 2 square, comma, and so on. What is alpha s? Alpha s is beta i square dot 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 up to beta s square, but nothing else. What is alpha s plus 1? Alpha s plus 1 is beta i square dot 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 up to beta s plus 1 square and so on and then alpha i is just beta i square. Right? And now you see the magic. The magic is we wanted to uh, determine what happens if we take all the alpha 1s up to alpha s proportional to rho. Now the new variables do exactly this. Namely, 
the unique thing about the first S variables is that they are all proportional to the single quantity beta S. So all of this depends actually on beta S square, but the rest is independent of the variable beta S. Therefore, we know that this thing here, without any further assumption, it behaves like beta S to the power two times Ls, times a constant plus higher orders in beta S square. Okay. But now there is nothing special about the variable S anymore. So this thing here is valid for any index S. So actually, just we can just go on. It is actually behaves like beta i to the power 2 l i times beta i minus 1 to the power 2 l i minus 1 and so on up to beta 1 to the power 2 l 1 minus uh, 2 l 1 times, let's say, a constant prime plus higher orders in all the betas. So we know precisely what happens if any of the betas goes to zero, or if all of them or any subset go to zero? It behaves like this. It has a polynomial uh, or a power-like behavior for small beta, and we know exactly by which power of the corresponding beta it goes to zero. Namely, each beta appears to the power corresponding to the number of loops associated with the subgraph which ends with this corresponding line. So here, of course, for this, for example, if you take this, that means as a function of beta 3, it goes like beta 3 to the power 0. So it behaves like a constant as a function of beta 3. So if we would go on beta 4, beta 5, beta 6, then as a function of beta 6, there is one loop, so it behaves like beta 6 square, and so on. Beta 7, to the power 4, beta 8 to the power 6, right? We know exactly the power law dependence on any of the variables beta. So overall, we can therefore also do an estimate this is bigger or equal than the following product over all the i's, beta i, to each time the corresponding uh, loop number times some constant prime. So you can introduce a constant and then you have a lower limit of your u depending on those powers of beta. Then you know u is smaller, uh, so bigger or equal than this. On the other hand, 1 over u is smaller than that, and so we can majorize our integrand and prove the convergence of the integral. So let's see whether it fits here. So our Schwinger parametrized integrand small alpha i, we know e to the i w is bounded, and then uh, yeah, okay, I would like to write it in a nice way, maybe here. So we then get the product over all the i's, d beta i, and then for uh, from the integration measure, we obtained this factor here. The 2 to the i is irrelevant, but uh, each beta, beta i, comes to the power 2 i minus 1. That is the factor coming from the integration measure. And then uh, we have u 
to the power minus d over 2. And now we can majorize the integrand. So this is smaller or equal, uh, loosely speaking, but the integrand is smaller or equal than the following product of all the integration measures, then um, product over all the i's up to this constant prime. So u behaves now like this. Therefore, we can combine the betas, beta i to the power 2 times the index i minus 1, then minus d over 2 times that minus d times l sub i. That's it. And now you see what beautifully emerges is exactly here the power counting degree. Two times the number of lines minus d times the number of loops minus the degree of divergence of the subgraph consisting of the first i lines. So we can write it maybe. Uh, and second, so that is what we see. And second, we see that all the integrals over all the betas become completely decoupled. So there is no uh, interdependence between the integrals at all. So each integral by itself can be treated. And each integral is a power-like integral. Each of the decoupled integrals behaves like or majorized by one integration d beta times beta to the power omega of the graph gamma i minus 1. So, and all the omegas are negative, therefore all of these integrals converge. Oops, uh, minus. Therefore, all the integrals converge. Okay, so that is the full proof of uh, our theorem. If all the subdiagrams have negative degree of divergence, then the full integral completely converges. And now you can discuss various uh, details, uh, what happens at the upper limit. So um, one discussion that you can do is, for example, if the epsilon in the propagators is really positive, then uh, you already mentioned, or some of you, then you really have an exponential damping, no matter what uh, other details appear in these semantic polynomials, because then i epsilon times the i gives minus epsilon times the alphas, and then you really have an exponential decay. And then you can show, or it's obvious, that the integral converges absolutely in the sense of mathematics, also at the upper limit, and anyway, at the lower limit, as we have proven, and then you have really an absolutely convergent integral. Similarly, uh, sometimes people go into what they call Euclidean space, where um, out of the Minkowski momenta, you make Euclidean momenta by a weak rotation. And then anyway, the entire exponential function has a negative exponent. So then we do not have i times the masses, but we really have minus times the masses and minus times these Euclidean positive definite momenta. And then also one has absolute convergence. But uh, what one also likes to study is, of course, the limit epsilon going to 0 uh, in Minkowski space. And then uh, the integral does not really converge absolutely anymore, but one has this conditional convergence. But uh, that is also established. But our proof now works at the um, lower integration limit, where the convergence is independent of the epsilon prescription. And here we have definitely shown that there is um, convergence. And the only trick, in addition to our previously established power counting, was this nice uh, change of integration variables, which completely decouples all the integrals and which makes manifest the power counting in all the different variables. So, and here maybe I can just give some comments and write some references on the blackboard. 
So this is not a complete history overview, but um, if I traced it back correctly, um, then I would say the following. So there are convergence proofs like this. But including uh, the R operation, that means we do not start by integrals which are completely finite, but they may be divergent. And then we apply this R operation from last uh, lecture where we subtract recursively the subdivergences. And then we can nevertheless apply a similar strategy to prove the finiteness. And that has been done first by Hepp in 1966. And he has done it using this uh, same language. And I think he probably invented um, this um, change of uh, integration variables. Then one can also do it similarly, a convergence proof using this method, but not using the recursive R operation, but the non-recursive forest formula. And that was done by Annikin uh, Savialov and Olivanov in 1973. And I already mentioned the paper by Berger and Lam, who also used the same uh, trick and the same method and also the forest formula to give an extended convergence proof compared to this one. But so here you see the history. And uh, other authors uh, proved, of course, the convergence directly, um, not using these Schwinger parameters, but for example, directly from the momentum loop integration. For example, Zimmermann did it like this. Okay, but this is the first convergence proof, uh, which is not yet, um, covering the case of um, divergent integrals, but nevertheless, it is a very important basic and first step, which covers uh, many Feynman diagrams, which are finite, like these ones here, for example. And uh, you see some tricks, and of course, these tricks might reappear in the more complicated proofs of divergent integrals. But so this would end our today's lecture. Thanks. Uh, the applause can be not necessary. <laughs>